Who would have imagined that a devoted wife and loving stepmother would vanish, leaving behind her loved ones? Katrina Smith was set for a big job interview on that fateful day. Excited about this new promotion, she shared the news with her family. But unfortunately, she never made it to the interview. Her colleagues called her husband, worried that their star employee was not at work that day. But here's the real shocker. Her husband didn't know where she was either. Panic set in and everyone asked, where's Katrina Smith? Little did they know that they would uncover a shocking truth that no one could have expected. Katrina Smith was a 30-year-old wife and stepmother to three girls, ages 21, 18, and 16. She had two siblings, Miranda and Chad, who described her as the funniest woman they'd ever met. Katrina made growing up fun for them, and while at home, she went on shopping trips with them or visited random eateries to try out new recipes. Her siblings could talk to her about anything and everything, and even though Chad didn't spend much time with the family, Katrina visited him often. She was friends with his wife and always gave him good advice. He was amazed at how much his younger sister knew. He admired her wisdom and kindness, and to Chad, Katrina was more than a member of the family, she was a true friend. Katrina worked with her husband, Todd, in insurance before working in the human resources department at Cameron Company in Belvedere. When Katrina wasn't working, she volunteered at Heartland Church. She had a bright, cheerful spirit that everyone noticed. She also enjoyed geocaching a fun community game where you use a GPS to go on a small treasure hunt to find trinkets or hidden items. Katrina's family says that her smile was infectious and spread wherever she went. Katrina Smith lived in McChesney Park in Illinois. This town is part of a larger community of Rockford. Rockford's about 100 miles from Chicago and about 20 miles from the Wisconsin border, known for being a blue collar community. When you visit this town, you'll see many industrial plants as you stroll along the river downtown. To locals, this is what the city is known for, but to outsiders, this is a place famous for Rockford peaches. Unfortunately, Rockford ranks top among the most violent cities in the US. This was where Katrina lived with her husband, Todd, and the two had met when Katrina was in her 20s while Todd worked as a DJ. And despite Todd being 15 years older, it didn't stop them from falling in love. Katrina told her friends that Todd fit in with her family. Even though Todd had three daughters from his previous marriage, it didn't matter to her. They got engaged and then got married. Katrina and Todd shared hobbies together at home and even ran a family business. The two spent every waking minute with one another. They'd been married for about seven years at the time of Katrina's disappearance. In fact, they celebrated their wedding anniversary with a vacation just a short while before she vanished. As far as everyone could tell, these two were deeply in love. But unknown to her family, it was all a show. Katrina was tired of her marriage and wanted to leave Todd. She'd moved out of their home and stayed with a friend in Roscoe for a while, and she had even met with the divorce attorney. Turns out, Katrina had secretly fallen for another man named Guy Gabriel and told him how unhappy she was in her marriage. She hoped to finalize her divorce with Todd and start a new life with Guy. Despite Guy being arrested for domestic battery, Katrina saw him as a genuine, honest man. He was everything Todd wasn't. But before settling in with Guy Gabriel and officially leaving Todd, Katrina wanted to get a new job. The night before her big job interview, October 22nd, 2012, she visited Todd's place to do her laundry, as well as finally break the news that she decided to file for divorce. We don't really know how this conversation went over with Todd, but it seems as though he took the news fairly well, all things considered. Katrina finally left the house at around 9 p.m. that evening but after that, she was never seen again. Her kids texted her multiple times, as did her husband and boyfriend, but all of their messages and calls remained unread and unanswered. No sooner than Katrina left the home that evening, she was gone. Considering Katrina never checked in with Todd to explain how the job interview went, and considering she never answered any of his calls, Todd was getting worried and called Katrina's sister, Miranda, to tell her he believed Katrina may be missing. Miranda was hopeful that her sister would be found later on that day, but this never happened. Todd later phoned Paige, his oldest daughter from his first marriage, and he told her he hadn't seen her stepmom for quite some time and couldn't get a hold of her. Paige was confused, 
Like Miranda, she knew Katrina would not just leave without a note or something. It was totally unlike her. After reaching out to all of their friends and loved ones and learning that no one had seen or spoken to Katrina in nearly 24 hours, that evening, Todd contacted local authorities to tell them about the disappearance of his wife. Earlier that day, Katrina's boss called Todd, wondering why she didn't show up for work. Every time before this, when she knew she wouldn't be at work, she would at least call and give some sort of notice, but not this time. Guy was confused too. He hadn't seen her that day, but knew she was at Todd's house the previous night. Todd told the police that his wife was scheduled for the interview that day, but never appeared. And he confirmed that she'd been with him that night before, and they chatted briefly, but then she just vanished. Hours after Todd Smith reported the incident, Katrina's photo was plastered all around Rockford. The news spread like wildfire, with everyone doing their best to try to track her down. What's really interesting is that weeks before her disappearance, Katrina Smith reported that someone was stalking her. Turns out, a teenager had developed an unhealthy obsession with her. He followed her everywhere, desperately seeking her attention. Of course, the 30-year-old had nothing to offer him, repeatedly turning him down, and her boss also recalled that something bizarre had happened in the parking lot. A guy had thrown flyers out of his car window, containing some bizarre accusations about Katrina. The contents of these flyers have never been confirmed, but police began to wonder if this man may have been involved in her disappearance somehow. Family, friends, and volunteers knocked on every door. They went to nearly every home in the area looking for evidence. They asked both children and adults questions about any suspicious movements in the area. Hundreds of people gathered for a candlelit vigil to pray for Katrina's return, but it ultimately felt like feeding a lion with breadcrumbs. Their efforts just weren't working. Meanwhile, Todd conducted numerous media interviews to appeal to the public to help his wife return home safely. He originally didn't want to go on TV because he feared people would judge him, but somebody convinced him that it might help, so he gave it a shot. It was clear to everyone who saw his pleas for help that this man was seriously struggling. His whole world was flipped upside down. When detectives really began to dig into the case, the first person they spoke to was Todd Smith. As investigators questioned Todd, the search party was out searching for evidence. Around 24 hours after Katrina's missing person report was filed, detectives stumbled across her blue Chevy Cruze, abandoned on the side of the road in a residential neighborhood. A day later, her purse was found about 150 yards away from the car. The following day, her cell phone was found in a bush beside the road. While her family tried to make sense of these findings, a search group found blood-soaked paper towels in a field just south of where her car was parked. This was not the news anyone had been hoping for. A couple of weeks passed by, and the case took a shocking twist when an off-duty firefighter who was fishing in the Rock River near Byron noticed something floating down the river like a log. Because it was dark, he couldn't see what it was, so he took out his flashlight and shone it on the strange object. Even though he couldn't determine what it was, a gut feeling told him something was wrong. As the light hit the water, he saw clothing on what appeared to be a torso. His heart raced as he realized it was a body. He immediately contacted the Winnebago County detectives, who arrived in just minutes. As they pulled the body from the river, it became very clear it had been floating here for quite some time. Although the victim was clothed, her dress was faded and unidentifiable. She was in such bad shape at the time that no one even knew who this person was. But after a forensic analysis was carried out, it was unfortunately determined that this was Katrina Smith. She'd passed away from blunt force trauma to the head or possibly drowning. It was never confirmed which of these truly claimed her life. She suffered numerous bruises on her arms, body, and legs, and it was clear she had been through a lot before she lost her life. The missing person case now turned into a heartbreaking homicide investigation. Detectives had a long list of suspects, including some family members. But first, they had to start with the last person she was seen with, Todd Smith, her husband. Katrina's phone became a crucial piece of evidence in her investigation. When the police retrieved it, they uncovered some shocking evidence. They found an unusually large number of text messages from Guy Gabriel on the night that she disappeared. This sudden spike in communication suddenly raised their suspicions. But Guy was at work that evening, so he had an airtight alibi. As far as police could tell, there was no chance that Guy was involved. As the police looked further into Katrina's life, though, they discovered 
she was being followed, and not by the obsessive teen that I mentioned a moment ago, but by someone else. She had a second stalker. Nobody knew who it was, but the evidence suggested it may have been Todd. Police began to look very closely at him. Unknown to many, Todd had an interesting criminal history. In 1985, when he was 17, he confessed to disconnecting a gas line in the home that he shared with his mother, stepfather, and three half-siblings. He stood outside as the home exploded into flames with his family still inside. Luckily, they all escaped the blast without major injuries. But when the police investigated the case, Todd openly confessed to arson. He told investigators that he had a fight with his mom and wanted to get back at her. He figured that the only way to do that was to scare her. He not only scared her, but he destroyed the home that they'd been living in for years. Todd was sentenced to 30 months probation and 160 hours of community service. He pleaded guilty to arson and waived his right to a trial. Todd later married his first wife, Teresa, and they had three daughters together. At the time, he struggled to provide for his family, and Teresa was getting overwhelmed. She worked full-time, and the burden of supporting the young family fell solely on her. After their third daughter was born, the couple was forced to sell their home to pay off debts. This was the last straw. Working two jobs and caring for three daughters and a husband was just too much to handle. Eventually, she filed for divorce, and they shared custody of their three daughters. But when Teresa thought that she was finally free of this bad situation, something terrible happened. Something she never spoke to anyone about until Katrina's passing. One evening, just as she pulled into the driveway of her mother's home, someone snuck up behind her as she was getting out of her car, punching her in the face without any warning. The attacker was wearing a werewolf Halloween mask. She quickly fell to the ground, enduring the punches and kicks of this masked man who just refused to let up. She thought about what would happen if her mother came out of the house to find her lying lifeless in the front yard. And this thought gave her a rush of adrenaline that was enough to jump off the ground, push her attacker backward, and then run for her life. A neighbor who heard her screaming phoned 911 and filed a police report that very night. When police spoke with Teresa later on and asked her who the suspect could be, she said, my husband, Todd. Police took fingernail scrapings from Teresa and compared them to fibers on Todd's jacket, but the results were inconclusive. They wanted to test for DNA, but Todd refused. Because the police couldn't get a search warrant to obtain his DNA sample, they closed the case and that was pretty much the end of it. But after the divorce from his first wife, Todd would meet Katrina, and they eventually got married and moved to Rockford, Illinois. Todd gave investigators plenty of reasons to suspect him for claiming Katrina's life. First, he grew agitated when he was separated from his family and friends during questioning. He didn't like that he was considered a suspect. Todd was so angry that he called Detective Vince Lindbergh to complain about the information the police gave Katrina's family. He questioned why the police told her family about the blood that was found in her vehicle's trunk. But the thing is, police hadn't found blood in Katrina's trunk. In fact, they'd only just received her car to begin processing it for evidence, but nothing had actually been processed yet. So how did Todd know that there would be blood found in the trunk? If that's not bad enough, well, things only got worse from here. For instance, while interrogating him, Todd turned red-faced and buried his head in his hands while making noises that sounded like crying. But when officers looked closely, they saw no tears. When officers confronted him with evidence from his wife's affair, he pretended to be shocked. But it was clear that Todd knew all along about his wife's infidelity and the identity of her lover. And that's because he'd previously found a card in Katrina's car that had come from Guy, in which he described her as the love of his life. Todd denied ever throwing vulgar flyers about his wife into the parking lot of her place of work. But a surveillance camera in the parking lot showed a vehicle that had no license plate, and police believed it had been borrowed from a local car dealership. The cops scoured every car lot in town to find a match, and eventually they found the dealership. The owner confirmed that Todd visited the store several weeks back looking for a car. The black Volkswagen in the corner of the lot caught his attention, and he test drove it around town. He further added that anybody who test drives a vehicle must provide a photocopy of their driver's license. He helped investigators get the license copies, and they found Todd Smith's photocopied license at the bottom of the stack. This confirmed that Todd took a car for a test drive on October 9, 2012, the same day the parking lot incident took place. On October 30th, police got a warrant to search Todd's house. 
and without alerting anyone, they stormed in and retrieved his laptop and a baseball bat from the garage. This bat appeared to be covered in blood. Detectives immediately sent the bat to the crime lab for analysis, and about three weeks later, they found traces of Katrina's DNA on the bat. Todd was immediately arrested. On the night of October 22nd, 2012, Katrina left her Roscoe condominium and headed to her husband's house to do her laundry. But laundry wasn't the only reason she went there. She planned to tell Todd that she wanted a divorce, as mentioned a moment ago. They'd been living separate lives for quite some time, but they did their best to keep this on the down low until a decision had been made. Well, Katrina made that decision and the divorce was filed for. When she broke the news to Todd, Todd tried to talk her out of the divorce, but she insisted she wanted to leave him. He even suggested that they adopt children together, insisting they could fix this, but she was adamant about moving on. She couldn't continue pretending that everything was fine when it wasn't. As the conversation was winding down, Katrina grabbed her things and planned on leaving, but as she neared the door, Todd grabbed a bat and unleashed on her. After she'd fallen unconscious, Todd then placed her in her car, drove her to the Ventura Boulevard area, and tossed her into the river. He then returned to the house on foot after abandoning her car and cleaning up the scene. When police got a hold of his laptop, they saw that he had a file on Katrina. This file included all of the location data for the past several weeks. Turns out, Todd had placed a tracker on her car and was following her every move. At this point, everything was beginning to make sense. His computer showed that Katrina was last seen on the Latham Street Bridge, exactly where her body was found. It took many months before prosecutors put the case together and charged Todd Smith with the crime. Just before her disappearance, Katrina visited a U.S. cellular store in Belvedere three times in October. A sales rep from the store appeared at the trial and told the court that Katrina was scared about her husband accessing her text messages. She didn't want him to know who she'd spoken to and what they discussed. She showed up at the store that day to see about getting a new phone number and a private account that Todd couldn't access. By now, Katrina was convinced that her husband was using her phone to track her movements, but little did she know that the tracker was actually placed on her car. The sales rep advised Katrina to get a restraining order against her husband, especially after she noticed Katrina's hands were shaking and she looked as though she might cry. Katrina never did get that restraining order. Katrina's stepfather, Bruce Edland, also took the stand. He told the jury that Todd had told him about their failing marriage. He didn't believe him at first, but when Katrina stopped joining him for church on Sundays, he was convinced something was wrong. A week before her passing, Katrina texted Bruce, asking him how to obtain an Illinois firearm permit. She also inquired if she could practice at a gun range without such a permit. Edland didn't take much meaning out of these questions, and he shrugged off the feeling that something might be wrong. Prosecutors invited Guy Gabriel to take the stand. He opened up to the public about his relationship with Katrina. It turned out that their relationship started in the office where they worked together. She worked in HR while he was a supervisor in another department. They spent the weekend before her passing together at her condominium in Roscoe. A few days later, in her final messages with Guy, she told him she planned to do laundry at Todd's house and watch Monday Night Football afterward. She also opened up about her plans to divorce Todd. He encouraged her to come clean and communicate with him, laying it all out so they were on the same page but her tone showed that she was scared of how Todd would react. In fact, she'd been deliberately keeping that information from him for fear of what he may do to her. Despite all of this evidence and all the witness statements, Todd maintained his innocence, but the judge disagreed with Todd. He called Katrina Smith's loss evil and senseless. He said, quote, the fact is, Todd Smith, you killed her. You beat her on the head with a blunt instrument and put her in the river. Your actions after the crime I find unfathomable you threw her in the river, like a plastic bag going down the river to Oregon. Needless to say, Todd was found guilty and was sentenced to over 50 years behind bars. In the aftermath of the trial, Katrina's family was immensely grateful for the verdict. Her mother, Vicky, let go of a sigh of relief as she finally got justice for her beloved daughter. The trial had been emotionally exhausting for her family, but thankfully Todd was exposed as the monster he truly is. Katrina was laid to rest at Arlington Memorial Park Cemetery on Mount Vernon Highway. In her memory, her family opened a foundation named Sissy's Footprints Foundation. 
This foundation is dedicated to helping people who've lost loved ones, especially under tragic circumstances, helping them learn to cope and giving them a shoulder to lean on when they need it most. The foundation's website is sissiesfootprintsfoundation.com and has a forum where people can share their stories of loss and connect with others for support. In the end, Katrina's family did their best to make the most of an awful, terrible situation. The senseless violence against Katrina is just heartbreaking, that's putting it lightly. To think that one man can feel so entitled, yet be so vile, such a nasty person, I just don't get it. In the end, Katrina had to pay the price for this man's senseless actions, and it just doesn't add up. I just hope that as time passed by, Katrina's family may find some level of comfort in knowing that this man can never hurt anyone ever again. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below or down in the comments to support the channel to see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.